Hello. I was just thinking about, um, I said we could go on to other things apart from talking about agricultural tools. I won't mention the one I mean. And um, there's a couple of things that spring to mind. One of these is oxygen. Now then, that's an interesting element, I suppose, an element, because I'm not very conversant with it. But um, it would be about 2002, 18 years ago, we happened to be staying temporarily in Honiton or close to. And in the village where we're staying, there's a chap going to give a presentation from the um, meteorological office in Exeter about um, meteorology or uh, weather and things like that. And um, I thought, well, I'll go along to that. It'd be quite interesting because I had a question to ask him. And anyway, for some reason, either due to weather or whatever, it didn't take place. But he did invite uh, people who were going to attend to ask any questions. So uh, one thing that puzzled me, and I thought, now's my chance. I said, um, are we ever going to run out of oxygen on this planet? And he wrote back quite a nice letter, quite a long letter, to say that there was no chance of running out of oxygen um, because it was so plentiful that there was no need to even be uh, for it to be considered. And it's always been in the back of my mind. I thought, well, he's discounted it, but I can't see why. So I've been having a bit of a look, you know, now and again to see what the position is. And I think we've got 78%, that's about of nitrogen in our atmosphere, 21% of oxygen. And I think it's about 1% argon on the rest of the trace. Even down to carbon monoxide is very much a trace, but it has a big effect. But I found out that, um, well, anybody can see, that originally, millions and millions of years ago, hundreds of millions of years ago, then there was no oxygen on this planet, virtually zero. It was a trace element like argon, and uh, about 1%. And, um, and what happened was that um, in the bottom of the oceans, because there was water, I suppose, uh, life started to develop without oxygen, because it didn't need it. It developed it in another way, different to us. We developed, and that's called anaerobic life forms. And this uses different chemicals or different elements to, uh, gen to make energy, which is needed to make life. And therefore, um, and that's what happened, and anaerobic life forms developed. And we see them around us in the world today, in, in trees and things like that. They're not non-breathing. You know, and they don't uh, breathe in uh, oxygen, and actually they breathe out, they exude oxygen, whereas they take in carbon dioxide and exude out oxygen, and that is their function. And they develop purely uh, like that. I mean, there was no reason it be, that was the only way it was available. It was anaerobic life forms, which means without air. And then they developed for a tremendous, um, hundreds of millions of years probably, doing that until they were breathing out this oxygen all the while, till um, the um, oxygen started to take over the atmosphere, being from just 1%, it developed into about 30% of the atmosphere. And this, um, this uh, oxygen explosion uh, went into the rocks around us, it was absorbed, because oxygen is a very active element. And it was also absorbed into the oceans, which accepted it quite readily, H2O, uh, because oxygen was locked in there, but it accepted any ex -ox ex -oxygen, ex excessive oxygen quite readily. So um, the oxygen was used up, and it went into making iron oxide in the rocks and things like that, and, uh, and that happened. And there was terrific variations in oxygen level from about 30% down to sort of 5%, if you like, but over the hundreds of millions of years we're talking about. And because this oxygen was available, life wants to spontaneously generate itself, so a different type of life was formed, totally different. And that idea uh, to make energy, which you need to have life, it made it from the oxygen, and that is us, and the uh, air-breathing 
the animals that are around us are, anaer are aerobic life forms because they depend on oxygen and they exude carbon dioxide. So we're in a sort of bit of a state of equilibrium now because we've got anaerobic life forms in the way of trees, plants and things like that make it, taking in carbon dioxide, giving up oxygen and we're the aerobic life forms that are taking in the oxygen and giving up carbon dioxide. And that was like in balance. I mean, if we got a bit out of kilt, it, it righted itself. But um, that's happened for millions of years. Uh, now then, what's happened recently, I can't take too long about this, I think we're going on, but um, what has happened recently, um, we have increased. And we are a parasite, if you like, on the uh, anaerobic life forms because we eat them, things like that. We cut them down and we use the firewood or whatever for furniture and, and for putting in, in furnaces to keep warm. And when we do that, we put in the plants and that consumes oxygen because this oxygen has taken out the atmosphere. Everything is something that, that takes uh, heat for energy, it consumes oxygen. You think of anything, wood burning stoves, power stations, cars, uh, you know, whatever you think. And, um, and they are consuming oxygen. Now then, don't you think things are going to be out of kilter? We've gone up to what is it, 6, 7 billion, and we're heading for 11 billion, we're all taking in oxygen and exuding carbon dioxide, but that is just a fraction of what has been consumed, because in the last, just the last sort of 50, 60, 70 years, to a greater extent, the increase in our inventions for uh, consuming oxygen has dramatically increased. Uh, coal, oil, power stations, uh, cars, and things like that, and all sorts of manufacturing processes that take in oxygen and uh, uh, exude carbon dioxide. So, um, that this comes completely out of kilter. And you would think that this would show. And it isn't showing really because of the fact that during the time when oxygen was plentiful, the oceans and water accepted the oxygen. It's extremely reactive. It goes into the water and it's locked in there because it wants to be there. And, uh, and, and that's where it is. And it's like a tank. It's like a, a reservoir. And then as we, you consume the oxygen in the atmosphere, it's ameliorated. It, it's not um, so obvious because the oxygen when the oxygen level decreases slightly, it is taken out of the, out of the, um, out of the oceans, out of the water. And so that is um, how it's held instead at present. But it's a reservoir, it's like a tank, and it's bound to dry up sometime. The, the, the oceans aren't all, they are very big compared to the atmosphere, exceptionally big but they're being uh, used in a tremendous way. I mean, the biggest consumers of oxygen are China. China consumes the most oxygen in the world. And the second one is America. And the third one is the cement manufacturing industry. They're the big, three biggest consumers of oxygen in the world. Now then, we've got 21% of oxygen. In the atmosphere, so should that worry us. It's very difficult to say how much oxygen is in the atmosphere, it's not easy to measure. But the other people have started to notice, they haven't commented on it, that the oxygen uh, in the atmosphere is beginning to decline. Now then, it could come to a catastrophic situation if all of a sudden the uh, oceans run out of oxygen. It's like taking taking, if you want, you want water, and you're taking water out of a tank, there's plenty of water, keep drinking, keep drinking. All of a sudden, when the tank is empty, you're in a bit of a, bit of a pickly situation. And is that where the human condition is leading the world? Because if, if we cause that problem, then virtually all anaerobic life forms will suffer. 
And when I say this 21% oxygen in the atmosphere, it's only going to decline by just a few percent and the effect will be felt. I mean, uh, it's noticeable in the oceans already because fish are moving north because as the ocean warms, it loses its oxygen. And algae blooms, which are anaerobic, the anaerobic are by algae blooms, blooms are taken over in the, in, the, in the oceans towards the tropics and the fish are moving north. And then it's also noticed that the rate of um, respiration in the fish is increasing. They're breathing faster. And so it's an indication that the oxygen is depleting in the oceans. And therefore the oceans, instead of being aerobic, are fast becoming anaerobic. And suit only suitable for anaerobic life forms. So it should be a point for consideration. And um, if anybody put a guess to me as to what one of the big problems of the world is, is what I've just described to you. It should be looked at. But it's nifty sort of thinking, giving it, giving it a thought. But it's very um, potent because we still, even though we have the ability to make energy without using oxygen, that's by uh, renewables, which is solar panels, wind turbines, uh, the tides, and uh, wave power, and things like that. Those are the things which we should be concentrating on if we had any form of common sense and judgment and uh, shutting and uh, going for electric cars and putting uh, wind turbines on and where I'm in the UK. All this rubbish about, oh, they look unsightly. They might look unsightly, but they might save your life. So you ought to be putting them up on virtually every piece of high ground you can get while you've got the chance because it can be possible that um, all of a sudden the oceans will cease to provide and then uh, humanity and the rest of the ecology of the world will be in deep trouble. So um, that's something that you ought to think about. That's one. Sorry to be a bit sort of pessimistic. I've just been realistic. So um, give it a thought. Perhaps you'll be able to comment on it. And I'll leave it with you. Bye.